14 years ago, I was riding with the triathlon cycle group. We would meet at Lover's Point Pacific Grove and get in a big circle and put our wheels towards the center and pray. And then we'd take off into Pebble Beach early in the morning, not much traffic, because Pebble Beach is a very challenging ride. But our practice was as we went along, we'd be single file if a car came by, but two by two so that we could chat, except on the hills where you can't breathe. But otherwise... We would chat. So, so I'd be alongside someone and say, how you doing? How you doing? Haven't talked to you in a while. What's going on? Then you rotate and you shift out. So finally, we're about 10, 50 miles into the ride, and I paired up with a guy that I know. And, you know, people learn that I'm a pastor, and that makes people ask questions and do stuff. So, <laughs> so he goes, do you believe people are basically good? I said, no, I don't. Let me tell you what I mean. I believe this is a troubled world, and as a Christian, I believe in what the Scripture says, that all the way back in the book of Genesis, mankind was given a choice, made the wrong choice, because freedom of choice means free to make the wrong choice, and sin became part of our DNA. I said, so, it, so people now need to have something greater than themselves. It's God for us and the risen Christ, so that the sin that's still in us doesn't run our lives so that the Holy Spirit has dominion and not the sin. And they said, well, I just don't really believe that. I think people are born good, basically good. So we continued on, and I said, well, I'm a student of history, not a historian, but a student of history. And are you aware that in all the records kept by civilizations of how things went in their civilizations, all the way back to tribal records, ancient cultures, civilizations, uh, countries that moved and changed and populations changed, there's no record anywhere in all of history of any group of people that were born good and stayed good the whole time. None. It doesn't exist. Yet there's plenty of record, thousands and thousands and thousands of records of what people have done that was dark and evil and troubling and painful and difficult to each other throughout all of history. I said, so wouldn't, don't you think that, that there should be at least one record, maybe one small tribe somewhere that when they go back to their history, they can cite that, well, we were all born good and we're still good and it's beautiful, isn't it? Here, look at what we've written down and tracked. It doesn't exist. I told them that, so the evidence doesn't support that. And here's what they said. Well, it's still my truth. I don't know what to say. It's a showstopper. You use the word truth, what do you do with that? What do you do with the word truth? And I, so the rest of the ride, I'm quiet going, what do I do with this? They, they pulled out the big T word and it shut everything down like tie, right? We tied, right? And I thought, no, it's rattling around to me and it has been for years. And with this opportunity to preach today on a subject that's important to me, I picked this one. And it isn't just that I wanted to preach it, I feel convicted to preach it. That's how it got inside of me today. So I have something on my mind today, and it's truth. What is it? What does the word mean? What are we saying when we use the word? How is this word used today in our rapidly shifting culture? Is it important that we know truths that we can rely on? Or do we just let the word and its historical meaning fade into diluted oblivion. Are we okay with that? So my goal today is to make the case that truth can be known. It has great meaning, especially when it directs lives. And, and in that direction can help lives be, be better. Lives can be harmonious and healthy and good. And I believe that the word, and I'm gonna make the case today that the word truth has been cheapened in its everyday use now, 
such that what people are really saying when they say the word truth in many of these instances I will cite for you, what they're really meaning is beliefs, experiences, thoughts, opinions, hypotheses, theories, but not truth at all. And I want to write this. I want to make it right again. So it's very different to say something is true than saying something is my truth. And we're going to unpack that. And the greatest truth ever known is found in Jesus, who is the truth. John 14, 6. I am the truth. I am the way and the life. None come to the Father but through me. So I want to do a pop quiz with you to kind of, kind of show how this works. The truth, my truth. How many of you today would raise your hands and verify that you believe, you understand that something is true when I say this? The Warriors, Golden State Warriors, just won the NBA championship. If you believe that's true, raise your hands. Those of you who didn't raise your hands, you don't believe it. Would you care to share with the audience what you do believe? Well, my point is that winning the championship is a valid, verifiable, evidence-based fact. But one analyst said on YouTube, which, you know, is the source for all kinds of stuff, said, I think it's true that we can look to the fact that they built the newest, most modern NBA stadium, and the NBA is the reason they won the championship. How many of you this morning would say, that's true? The reason they won the championship is they have the best new facility. Raise your hand. So here's the difference. That they won the championship is based on valid, verifiable evidence repeated over and over again. They won. This other person saying it's true that they won because of the facility is not validated, it's not verifiable, and it's not based on evidence. What's it based on? Their opinion, their belief, their thinking, and their theory. I want to make the case today that there are truths that exist that aren't just someone's experience, belief, and their theory. And we need to know what those are. I have a quote here by a, a great theologian, one of the most influential of the last 100 years, Dr. Francis Schaeffer. And he said this. He said, truth always carries with it confrontation." Truth demands confrontation, loving confrontation nevertheless. If our reflex action is always accommodation, regardless of the centrality of the truth involved, there is something wrong. I agree with him. There is something wrong. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Years and years ago, I worked for 10 years in a county mental health department as a clinician and then a manager. We had a staff lounge that we would go to in between clients to kind of let off steam and debrief. Had a great conversation going with a group in there until there was only two of us, myself and this one friend, great person, I'll just call Jane. And it was well known that Jane followed Eastern religions. In fact, she was very pleased to share with anyone that she was a Zen Buddhist and loved being a Zen Buddhist. So we had this conversation. It was a respectful and dignified conversation where we each presented our position. And I looked down and go, oh my gosh, I got a client coming up, I got to run. She goes, you know, I, this is just great, see? We had this conversation, your beliefs work for you and my beliefs work for me. And I went, this is accommodation. I started to go, yeah, isn't that great? And then something stopped me. I said, that's not what happened here. She presented it as though we both went to beliefs are us. And I was in ILA, and she was in ILG, and we each found something we really liked. And we took it out and said, isn't yours shiny, mine shiny? Aren't they both great? I said, I, I, said, I got to tell you, Jane, that's not what happened for me. I said, I came to Christ when I was 18, and then I drifted away, and then something happened, and I was exposed to events that are true, that exist in history, that really happened, and I couldn't turn away from them. It wasn't, I wasn't looking for beliefs that'll make my life work better. I ran smack into truth. And I found that truth in the crucified Christ and the empty tomb and the resurrection. So that's the difference. And so there is something wrong. Now let's say a few words about truth itself. I found an interesting quote from a uh, 
a man who lived in the 15th century, Blaise Pascal, mathematician, physicist, philosopher, theologian. And, and, and he shares a concept here I'll unpack for you that was really new to me, but it makes perfect sense. He says, for the truth is always older than all the opinions men have held regarding it. And one should be ignoring the nature of truth if we imagined that the truth began at the time it became to be known. Here's what he's saying. There was a time in the history of the world where all scientists, philosophers, uh, priests, preachers all believed that the world was flat. It's true. And then at some point, the discoveries were made that it was actually round. Well, it didn't become round when they discovered it. It had always been round. There was a time in the history of humankind where people believed the sun actually moved. It rose up, it traveled across the sky, and then it set, which kind of makes sense. But then they discovered that the earth actually orbits the sun. It didn't become true the moment they discovered it. It had always been truth. Truth can be established and it can be known, it can be understood. Pascal also said something else. He said that people base their beliefs usually on what they find attractive, not necessarily the truth. Can truth be unattractive? Absolutely. In my own walk, as I had drifted away from the church in Christ, I came across a book, and it was intriguing to me. The book title was The Resurrection Factor. It was by Josh McDowell. And his whole life has been about find the evidence to support it, get the facts to support it from the, all the fields of science and archaeology and geology. That's his deal. And I read this book, The Resurrection Factor, and it changed everything. Why? Because in it, what he does is he looks at the medical aspects of crucifixion. He looks at the military rules and law of those who are guarding the tomb. He looked at the current Jewish political scene and who ruled what and how did the rules of trial and burial and tombs work. He looked at the geography, he looked at everything. And he came up with this reality. He rose. Jesus is who he said he is and he rose from the tomb. And I was mad about it. I mean, I, was, I drifted away because when I read it, I knew it was true. I went, man, what am I going to do with this? Immediately, it wrecked Friday night, and it wrecked Saturday night. <laughs> it really did. Just, oh, great. This is just great. But I couldn't hide from the fact that I knew it was true. Go anywhere you want. There it was. Turn around. There it is. It's true. Man, it changed everything. So what is the definition of the word truth? We find in Encyclopedia Britannica, truth is the property of sentences, assertions or claims, beliefs, thoughts, or propositions that are said in ordinary discourse, ordinary conversation, to agree with the facts or state what is the case. Well, I had a question for you this morning. Have you ever heard these kinds of statements? I'm going to walk you through some statements. I have, so I'm preaching this morning. How about this one? I need to live my truth. Or it's my truth. Or, or you can have your truth and I can have mine. Or everyone has a right to their own truth. I'm speaking my truth. Oh, they don't have to agree, but they can each have their own truth. And here's this one. And this kind of inspired me to teach on this. You have to accept my truth. That really bothered me. That really troubled me. I, I do? What are you saying? So at least one philosopher put it this way. When you say, I've spoken my truth, or that this or this thing is my truth, it automatically suggests that you are aware there is something called the truth somewhere, but you found it important to say that you have a different point of view and now you're calling it my truth. You understand there's something else there and you want to distinguish yourself from it. 
It automatically implies that. So, so if we go back in history, the prominent Greek philosophers of all, we think of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. All of them saw truth as something that can be known, understood, and validated, and should be lived out in one's life. That's not even Christian. That's secular Greek philosophy. But there was a different community of philosophers at the time. They were called sophists or sophists. And I want to tell you what they believed, and then I'll unpack it for you. They believed truth was whatever a community of equals with diverse opinions convinced one another to believe was true. Whatever a community of equals with diverse opinions convinced each other to believe what is true. How many of you remember this? The tree huggers of Cal Berkeley. You remember that? All right, here's a picture. Cal Berkeley, as a result of a long, long process, finally got approval in the funds to make renovations to upgrade their football stadium. But however, there were some trees that, that had been there a long time that had to be removed. And back then even, people were outraged. People came from all over to go there and go up and live in the trees. Because as long as there was someone living in the tree, the contractors wouldn't cut them down. And you might think, well, they're all for, you know, carbon dioxide converted to oxygen. It's about ecology. It wasn't that at all. You know what it was about? Their belief that trees were sentient beings. In other words, trees had hopes and dreams and fears and, and concerns, and they could know these trees, and they named them and said they could talk with them. That's what we mean with a group of people equals with diverse opinions, convinced one another that something was true. I believe that kind of thing is happening in our culture today. I just believe it. Because our Western culture now more than ever, I think prizes individualism, my truth, my feelings, my needs, I'm my own person, and so on. And we're trained to see and experience culture through, number one, my own personal filter. There is no collective. There is no group. It's what I think. And you know what? That has some value. It really does in life. There are people who've never experienced their own thoughts as being worthwhile and valid and charting a course. So I support all of that. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. If I settle for this type of individualism, then everything boils down to what do I think, what do I value, what do I like and don't like, what do I feel or not feel? And the problem is it, we can increasingly, and I believe this is happening with the word truth, we can take the historical meaning of the word and just throw it out the window. And there's other words, we just throw it out the window. I don't need it anymore. I'll tell you what it means. And you have to accept what I say it means. And we can't stand for that. Because if we stand for that, we have nothing to stand on. You see? So there was a question posed to the website Quora. Any of you look at Quora? I do. You know, it tracks what your interests are. And mine always come up like, can an MMA fighter beat up a heavyweight boxer? I don't know why. <laughs> Go, oh, I got to read this. Anyway. The answer is it depends. <laughs> Here's a question somebody put to Quora. Saying it's my truth, does it make sense to say that? And one answer was, yeah, absolutely. To the person who says it's true. That person has taken something that appears to them to be true to heart and that person believes in its truth. Therefore, they get to use the word. Where our culture is saying this today, I believe everyone should be free to determine for themselves what is true. It's considered a human right, an honorable, self-focused quest, a self-validating exercise that is automatically granted near holy status. It shuts everything down when somebody says it. It's my truth. Oh, the end. It's almost like my wife Heather and I. We're in a conversation. It may go like this. I might say, I love you, honey. She'll say, I love you the most. Infinity double lock. <laughs> Stops everything right in its tracks. Nothing more can be said after that. But I must confess, on occasion, she plays Calvin Ball. 
She changes the rules as we go. <laughs> Truth kind of does that if you use the word like that. What's it designed to do? All right, I'm going to throw the word out. My truth. And you're supposed to go, oh, your truth. Okay. I see. And I don't think we need to buy it. Tim Keller is the founder of Redeemer Church in Manhattan. A wonderful author, scholar, teacher. He's taught at Google, taught at Oxford. He wrote The Reason for God, The Meaning of Marriage. I'm a huge fan. I'm going to share a couple of statements he said about this very thing we're talking about today. He said this, he says, culture says everyone should be free to determine their own truth and what is right or wrong for them. Absolute truth, culture says, is the enemy of freedom. Absolute truth harms and erodes freedom. And the problem the world has with Christians is this. One of the problems people have with Christianity today is that we, those who believe in Christ as their Savior, we know what absolute truth is. And we abide by it in our commitment to Jesus Christ and the Bible. That's a problem for the culture today. That's a problem. So what does the Bible say about truth? Well, it says a lot. I've selected just some verses that came to mind to talk about the different aspects of truth and how they are foundational in our life and give us the life we were designed to have. We'll start with this, John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but through me. Important is, when is he saying that? He's preparing his followers because he's ready to go into the garden. He knows he's gonna be put on trial in a sham of a trial. He knows he's gonna be brutally tortured, die on the cross, be buried in the tomb, and rise again. And he's saying, there are ways you can go. People are going different ways. There's a lot of roads. Let me tell you the way. There is the way, and it's through me. That's, in, that's absolute truth. What else does scripture say? Jesus also says in John 8, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Culture says you will not be free, but what we know is the truth, we can know the truth and it will set us free. And Paul says in Ephesians, in a classic chapter six, where we get all the, the um, armament we need to battle against evil and darkness, Paul says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Truth can be a belt that sustains and holds. He goes on to, oh no. Old Testament goes on to say in Psalm 25, 5, guide me in your truth and teach me for you are my God and Savior and my hope is in you all day long. Then Paul says in 1 Corinthians, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. And he also says in Philippians, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. And those, those are classic verses in Philippians chapter four that Paul writes from prison trying to say, this is how you can live. Even if you're in prison like me, you can choose a focus that will give you a vibrant, rich, purposeful, and meaningful life. And it's grounded in truth. And then John writes in 3 John, it gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And then Jesus in trial, trial is going, John 18. When questioned, Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king? In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What can we know about truth as it's found in these verses? Number one, simply, Jesus is the truth. He doesn't teach the truth, tell the truth, acknowledge the truth. He is 
the embodiment of truth itself. Next, Jesus, as well as other truth we find in Scripture, can be known. It can be known. And truth can be buckled around us to help us stand firm, to hold us together, to keep everything working when we're in trial or just walking in our life. We can be taught and guided in truth. We learn it in Bible studies, in your own Bible reading. We learn it by hearing teaching. We learn it by conversations that are truth-based with others. We can be guided and taught in the truth. And then we learn that love rejoices in the truth. The truth doesn't crush us, oppress us, hold us back from, rob us of our freedom. We rejoice in the truth. It opens the door to heaven. And Paul teaches us that we can choose to focus on truth. When he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, he's implicit in there is you can choose to focus on this or you can choose to focus on that. The truth can be known and the truth can be focused on. And then we learn we can be on the side of truth if we listen to Jesus. We can be faithful to and walk in the truth. And Jesus testified and still testifies to the truth. I read a, uh, a quote from Blaise Pascal, that philosopher I mentioned earlier, and this just rocked me in a beautiful way. I've never even heard it put this way. 15th century philosopher said this. Once your soul has been enlarged by a truth, it can never return to its original size. Once your soul has been enlarged by a truth, it can never return to its original size. And that book, The Resurrection Factor by Josh McDowell, which is still in print, is in me. That truth that I discovered in there, at first it just bugged me. And then I just absorbed it. It was in me and I grew and now I absolutely love it. But my soul has never retreated to the size it was before I took that in, which was everything, Jesus is who he says he is. Everything he said he would do, he did. The death, entombment, and resurrection, and new life in Christ is absolutely true. And it's, my soul has never returned to its original size. So I want to propose to you this morning seven principles that we need to be firmly grounded in. Number one, the world is fractured. It is. Lest you read the paper or watch the news now and think, well, you know, today's world, it's really bad. I'm sorry. Quick look at history. It's always been like this. It's only shaped differently with different factions. People have always taken other people's land from the earliest record of the first empire because it took somebody else's stuff. People have always harmed each other. There's always been this self-centered intent, this, this kind of sin-based evil that we, we want to harm others and do harm. And it's just real. It's just real. I'm not trying to be a wet blanket on it, but it's just real. Next, a principle. In troubling ways, beliefs and opinions, and I'll add experiences, thoughts, theories, have co-opted the word truth in our Western culture. And I'm not having it. I hope you aren't either. Next, absolute truth does exist and is objectively verifiable. Next, we can know and live by absolute truth. We can know it and live by it. And this absolute truth is found in Jesus. He is the truth. Number six, objective absolute truth is found in the Bible. And if you have any curiosity, if you want to learn more about how we can say the Bible is absolute truth, I'll send you to josh.org. Josh McDowell spent probably over 40 years doing comprehensive, in-depth research to establish the validity and truth of the Bible itself and what is said in the Bible and how events have unfolded. I would encourage you to do that. But here's this other principle, this last one. And I've been going through this. I have to ask myself, you need to check yourself. Do you use the word truth in this cultural fashion? Have you been? Just think about it. Look at it. If so, let yourself see it. Let yourself be convicted of it. How do we address it? So I have a question for us this morning. Can we reconfigure? Is it okay 
to reconfigure, redesign the gospel into just another system of beliefs, opinions, and experiences that people choose and agree on in their journey to find meaning and enlightenment? What's the answer? No, absolutely not. We will not do it. So we're gonna leave here today and I have some desires I want us all to recognize together. Let me share those with you. Number one, again, there's absolute truth that we can know. Two, it's found in Jesus and the Bible. Third, we can dwell on truth. Dwell, the word dwell means to unpack, organize, and take up residence in. We can dwell in truth. We don't just have to say, well, I know the truth is over there. We can dwell in it and live in it. And then we trust him to guide us as we pray for direction. And last, we help others to know him, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. At Shoreline, one of the things we teach, it's embedded in the hearts of the staff, is organic outreach. Organic meaning how it works for you, just natural. And outreach means not keeping what you know about salvation in Jesus and scripture to yourself, but praying about and looking for ways that you can maybe share. And I don't mean being that preacher. You're not a Billy Graham. I'm, maybe you are, but I'm not. It's not that. But I can certainly on a Sunday when I go into Safeway, they say, how's your day going? I say, oh, it's a great day. This is the best day ever. I know they're gonna ask. What makes it so good? I was in church. I'm a pastor. That's organic outreach. I'm just saying. But we do all need to ask ourselves today, if we have something we've claimed as truth, maybe recently or over time, but when we look at it, it actually isn't. I can't really validate it or verify it. And if you can, then may I suggest, take the truth, the word truth, and put it aside and just use the appropriate word. It's my belief. It's my experience. It's my understanding. It's my theory. It's my thought. It's my conclusion, but not it's my truth. We want to save that word for absolute real truth. And my last encouragement to you, please allow truth to enlarge your soul. Fill it up with scripture, your soul. Fill it up with reflection on the love of God. Fill it up with the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and the presence of the Holy Spirit in you every day, all day. And your heart will enlarge to accommodate this and it will never be the same. It will never go back to its previous side. Pray with me. Lord God, thank you. Thank you, Father. We're not, we're not just following a set of beliefs that make us feel better. We're following truth, biblical truth, historical truth, evidence-based truth, found in you. Thank you, because that's the rock we hold on to. When the wind blows and the storm comes, and those, those truths guide our lives, are grounded in your holy word given to us, in your scripture, and your, and your prophecies lived out through the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are the most blessed people ever, because in our hardest times, confusing times, uncertainty. We know we can go to truth and hold on to truth and you will bring us through. We love you. Thank you for that free gift of grace, undeserved love, and we receive it humbly. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dennis, for a great message this morning. I appreciate you. Before we take off uh, this morning, I just want to draw your attention to the screens real quick because we have a lot of fun things that happen on campus. And the first one is uh, summer day camp for our kids is coming up. And Pastor Greg and his team have done a phenomenal job of putting together a great summer day camp that your kids will not want to miss out on. But the deadline to register is this coming Friday, July 8th. So if you've been on the fringe a little bit, you're not sure, I wanna encourage you to sign up. If you're waiting to share with a family or invite them to come, just make sure you invite them and say, register by this Friday. 
Secondly, one of my favorite nights of the week is coming up, and that is Night of Worship this Wednesday, uh, July 6th, I believe it is, at 6.15 right here in the Worship Center. And I know that some of you love to be out in the courtyard, and we're going to have the courtyard open as well. Um, and if you're not on campus, we'd love for you to join us online. But this is just a time for us to come together to hear great teaching, take communion together, and just hear, hear some great and sing great worship with Cole and his team. So we'd love to have you for that. And don't forget, we do offer kids programming from nursery all the way up to fifth grade that night. So bring the kids with and come out for a great night. If you're with us this morning and you need prayer, if you're right here in the worship center, I just want to encourage you to come to the front. We are going to have a great team up here that would love to pray with you. And if you're joining us online, you can call the number right on the screen and they would love to pray with you and connect with you. And if you're outside uh, in the courtyard, there's actually going to be somebody on the right side of the Jumbotron, and they'd like to pray with you as well. And if you're new here, I just want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, you can text the word welcome to the number on the screen, and that'll give you our digital connect card. But if you're with us right here in the worship center, I'd love for you to make your way right out to the connection center because our team would love to welcome you and greet you and give you a great gift. If you're willing, I'd like you to stand. I just want to give you a blessing as we head out this morning. As you go from this place, stand on the truth. Stand on God's word. Take his truth to a broken and fractured world. Don't be ashamed of it because there's a world that desperately needs the truth. We'll see you next Sunday. Great to be with you guys.